Greetings, friends of the Urban Theological Institute, on behalf of United Lutheran Seminary. I'm Dr. Guy Irwin, new president of ULS and former bishop of the ELCA in the Los Angeles area, and I welcome you to this 40th anniversary celebration of the Urban Theological Institute under the theme of celebrating our past, embracing our future. The Urban Theological Institute was born out of the dreams of visionary African-American pastors in the Philadelphia area and found from the beginning a willing partner in our Lutheran seminary here. Now, 40 years later, both the seminary and UTI are in a new, more mature and deeper relationship than ever before. I rejoice in that and believe that our futures will be increasingly intertwined to the good of both and of our whole community. You will hear more shortly from the Institute's Executive Director, Dr. Quentin Robertson, about the events that comprise this week's celebration. But let me say first how grateful I am to the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley of Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, for being our guest lecturer this year. His lecture carries a powerful message and speaks profound truths that will be uncomfortable for some to hear, but which are necessary for all of us. And I thank him for being with us. Let me say again here also at the beginning how deeply proud United Lutheran Seminary and I are of our four decades of work together with the Urban Theological Institute, and how deeply I hope that we, with God's help, will continue to make a difference together in our common future. What we do here is a blessing to our church, our community, and the nation. May God bless this celebration, our work together, and you who are here to join in this celebration. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Welcome to the 40th anniversary of the Urban Theological Institute, also known as the UTI. UTI was founded here at United Lutheran Seminary on our Philadelphia campus in 1980 by the late Reverend Dr. Randolph Jones, an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church, and the late Reverend Dr. Andrew Willis, a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Now, due to COVID-19, we are not celebrating on campus as we had thought we would, but virtually we are celebrating, and I'm happy I'm grateful to God because of social media that allows us not to limit our seating capacity to only 200 in one room, but now around the world you can celebrate with us. And so I welcome you on behalf of our president, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin, Utica, which is our UTI Committee of Advisors, both our current and our past members, our entire seminary community, students, staff, faculty and alumni, and my colleague on the faculty, the Jeremiah A. Wright Associate Professor of Homiletics and Liturgics in African American Studies, the Reverend Dr. Wayne E. Croft, Sr. As we prepare for our celebration, I want to make an appeal to you that during this celebration, we are raising funds to completely endow the chair in African American studies here at our seminary. And during this time where we see much racial tension, it really shows the need for the black church and the importance of education for our ministers. And so as they show online now, there are several ways you can give. Of course, you can send your donation to the campus we ask that if you send a check, that you make it out to United Lutheran Seminary. You mail it to the attention of the UTI office at 7301 Germantown Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19119. Of course, you can give online at uls.edu backward slash give. And in that, you will find the Jeremiah A. Wright endowed chair. Select that and give. Or you can also text to give, and of course, that information is online for you. Also, while that is showing, on tomorrow at 1145 a.m., we invite you to come back for the ULS alumni chapter, where one of our UTI alumni, the Bishop Patricia Davenport, will be the preacher. Bishop Davenport is the first African-American female bishop 
in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And then on tomorrow evening, our lecturer today will be our preacher on tomorrow at 7 p.m., the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. As we prepare now for our lecture, I ask that you sit back and prepare to listen and be open, be receptive, and hear what the Spirit says to us. Let me briefly introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, the lecturer for our 40th anniversary. He is the exciting, gifted, and anointed pastor of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, with more than 10,000 members and over 50,000 plus viewers that watch him online monthly. Dr. Wesley earned his undergraduate degree from Duke University. He earned his master's degree from Boston University School of Theology and his doctor of ministry degree from Northern Baptist Seminary. Presently, he is a PhD student in African American preaching and sacred rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary. Dr. Wesley is regarded as one of the most prolific and prophetic voices of justice and grace in our generation. His sermon, When the Verdict Hurts, was acknowledged in Time Magazine July 29, 2013's cover story, After Trayvon. And it was acknowledged as one of the best sermons preached in the USA following a not guilty verdict for George Zimmerman. Three of his sermons have been archived in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. There is much more that I can say about him, but I say sit back, listen to this raw lecture that will challenge you, and I say to you to be open and receptive, and please note that the opinions and views expressed of those of our guest presenter do not necessarily reflect the views and policies of United Lutheran Seminary. Let us now receive the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father and our Mother, and Jesus Christ who alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning Redeemer. I'm Pastor Howard John Wesley from the Alpha Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And let me say how humbled, honored, and really grateful I am to be able to share in this 40th anniversary of the Urban Theological Institute, especially as we gather virtually online in this space in the midst of the world in which we live, how important it is for us to take a step back and reflect over relevant and real ministry and what it means to be the prophets of God in these trying times. I wanna thank my brother Quentin Robertson for the invitation to come and share once again, not only in the word of God and worship on tomorrow, but even in lecture on today. My attempt, my goal for the next few moments as we gather together is to share some theological reflection on some of the themes and the issues that undergird the sermon that you'll hear tomorrow and my preaching overall in these days and times. I'm always grateful for the opportunity to be able to step back as we all need to every now and then to critically reflect upon the theology that informs our homiletic and our preaching. And my prayer is that this time together will not only be exposing, it will be informative, even if that means creating some safe space for difference and discussion and disagreement. I think it goes without saying that we live in the midst of some very turbulent times. One author has suggested that Black Lives Matter is one of the greatest movements in the history of the United States of America outside of civil rights. We live in the midst of, of violence and vulgarity that is being exposed through the race, the riots, the resurgence of white supremacy in our land. We're preparing for one of the most critical elections, at least in my lifetime, between two very different and divergent visions of what the United States of America should be. And that's not even to mention the global pandemic that's taking a toll on American life and American lifestyle. I have suggested, and I know you can disagree, 
that COVID-19 has exposed the racial depravity of the United States of America. It's proven to me that Professor Derek Bell, who now rests with the Lord, was right in his, faces, in his book Faces at the Bottom of the Well, that racism is an inextricably woven fabric into the society of America, that America is built on, shaped, and has to deal with its racist history on a continual basis. As a black pastor who stands in the tradition of black preaching and ministers in a predominantly black congregation, the racial memory, the racial pain, and the racial urgency of this moment is something that I do not have the privilege of running from. It's something I can't edit out of my theology. It's something that's birthed and born personally as well as pastorally and informs my prophetic understanding. I would suggest to you that only those who operate from a deliberate place of historical racial ignorance or the protection of racial and economic privilege can deny the racism that is blatantly before us today. Let me repeat, only those who operate from a deliberate place of historical racial ignorance or the protection of racial and economic privilege can deny the blatant racism that we experience every day. How can you see the unarmed black man, Jacob Blake, being shot seven times in the back and compare that with Kyle Rittenhouse, an underage minor who illegally openly carries an automatic rifle openly through the streets of Wisconsin, kills two people, is arrested peacefully, is then represented by the president's lawyer who identifies him as a shining example of the fighting American spirit and you not see race. How can you call white supremacists in Charlottesville very fine people and have the audacity of calling Kamala Harris a nasty woman and not see race? How can you know that a no-knock warrant was issued in the home of Breonna Taylor at the wrong address, the police did not identify themselves, they open up shooting 20 times into her apartment, leave her dead, and are not arrested, and yet know that a young man can enter Mother Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, open fire, and is peacefully arrested, and you not see race. How can you hear our president refer to officers who shoot unarmed black men and liken them to golfers who choke on a putt and not see race? You don't want to. And I don't know what your theological take is. I don't know what your preaching perspective may be or your party, politic, and affiliation. But as a black man, as a preacher in the prophetic black tradition who stands at the pulpit to challenge America and my people, I want to share with you that there are at least three issues that undergird that preaching. Three things that I take into consideration that prayerfully I ask you to consider the next time you stand to declare and teach the word of God. The first is this. What role does social justice have or not have in the ministry of the church? What role does social justice play or should not play in the ministry of the church and in the preaching of our pulpits? Where do we locate the emphasis on social justice? Let me tell you a little story. When Black Lives Matter began, I thought it important to share with this community that Alpha Street Baptist Church stands with the Black Lives Matter moment. After speaking with the leadership of our church, we created a very large banner that sits outside of our church in our portico that simply says Black Lives Matter. On the very front of the church, 
is a banner reminding all who drive by Black Lives Matter. What's interesting is that as you look at that banner in the portico, it sits right underneath the cross that adorns the highest point of our church like it does many churches. Any good church with a steeple has a cross up top. So when you drive by the front of Alpha Street Baptist Church, you see the cross of Jesus Christ and right underneath it, the sign Black Lives Matter. The cross and social justice. One of our neighbors drove by, got out and I was having a conversation with him. And he said, that's theologically inaccurate. That that's inappropriate. How can you put a statement about social justice and politic underneath the cross that there should be no politic or social justice attached to the cross of Jesus Christ? Because there are some who believe that our churches and our pulpits are not the appropriate place for social justice. That's not where we advocate a political stance. That's not where we should be speaking about politics or race. That with the cross, all we should be speaking about is salvation in Jesus' name. As a matter of fact, the Southern Baptist Convention in June of 2019 convened a panel of all white male pastors. And the panel was entitled, The Dangers of Social Justice Within Evangelicalism. Listen to the title of the panel, The Dangers of Social Justice Within Evangelicalism. Because in their mind, evangelicalism with its conservative theology and its authority of scripture, identify social justice as a dangerous threat to what they consider to be the true essence of the message of Jesus Christ. Our brothers and sisters on the evangelical right with their conservative theology and their view of Bible lift up personal piety and conservative sexual morality to the absolute exclusion of social justice as if social justice is blasphemous to the gospel. So again, I ask you, what role does social justice have within the ministry of the church and the proclamation from our pulpits? The answer for me is simple. It begins with the realization and a remembrance that although Jesus died for our sins, Jesus was killed for something else. Make certain you catch this. He dies for our sins, but that's not why he was killed. Answer this question for me. Why was Jesus crucified? Remember, crucifixion was a political statement by the Roman government. Why did the Roman government believe Jesus was worthy of a state-endorsed execution? You can disagree with me. But I would suggest to you that Jesus was not crucified because he said, love God. Jesus wasn't crucified because he said, forgive people when they've done you wrong. Jesus wasn't crucified because he said, turn the other cheek. Jesus was not crucified because he said, love your neighbor. Jesus was crucified for political reasons. Jesus was crucified because he offended the Pharisaic tradition of using religion to oppress widows, orphans, and sinners. And the Pharisees were so offended by his challenging their use of religion to mask over their injustice that they turned him over to Rome on trumped up charges that he was somehow subversive to the Roman government and he is crucified not because he preached the kingdom of God. He was crucified because he advocated for justice and equality for the least within his society. As you walk through the Bible, you will see that God's greatest displeasure with Israel was never about religious matters. That God was not simply upset because they didn't worship correctly. God was not always upset simply because of idols. But if you read the Bible correctly, God's deepest displeasure with God's people 
was always about how they treated widows, orphans, and strangers. That God is upset with them about worshiping Baal as much as God is upset with them for the way they treated strangers, immigrants, foreigners. I, I would share with you and my evangelical brethren who read Sodom and Gomorrah and believe that based on what we read in Genesis 19, that it was a sexual issue. But when you get to Ezekiel 16 and God speaks to Israel about Sodom and Gomorrah, God declares that the reason Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed is not necessarily sexual or pious or moral. It was because they neglected the poor and the needy. Read your Bible. What does the Lord require of these, says the prophet Micah? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. The ministry of Jesus was not simply religious and spiritual, it was political. And I would argue with you that any ministry, any church, any pulpit that never advocates for justice has missed the mark to mimic the ministry of Jesus himself. That if all we preach is heaven, and if all we preach is sexual morality, and if all we preach is pray, and if all we preach is forgive, that we have failed to mimic the real ministry of Jesus Christ. So because I identify social justice as the core of what Jesus has come to do, I find no conflict wearing a black hoodie to the pulpit to preach about Trayvon Martin. I feel no hypocrisy giving you a membership registration form and a voter registration form because you can't be a member of this church and not be registered to vote. I feel no conflict standing in the pulpit preaching from Psalm 137 declaring I'm mad as hell. I have no conflict believing that it's right to call out the racial hypocrisy of our nation. I have no conflict calling out the immorality and the injustice of this president. I feel no conflict leading a prayer march in Washington, calling upon 5,000 praying people to pray for the change of this land. And even if you are not black, I'll suggest to you that social justice and political advocacy should be dominant in your preaching during the season. I want you to reread Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail where he calls upon our white clergy to stand in support of civil rights. And he says, it is not the voice of our enemy we will remember. It is the silence of our friends. Beloved, I suggest to you that social justice and theology and the cross and Jesus Christ all go hand in hand. That it is not blasphemous to preach Black Lives Matter. It's blasphemous not to preach it. It's not out of order to blend Christ and social justice. It's out of order to remove it from Jesus Christ. At the core of our ministry must be an advocacy for justice. So the very first thing that undergirds my preaching is an understanding of the role social justice plays in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second issue for me is learning to differentiate between prophecy and false patriotism. That we must delineate between prophecy and false patriotism. One of the greatest crimes in American religion has been the blending of the gospel with this fake patriotism, so much so that there'll be some on the evangelical right who would lead you to believe that God is American, that God sings the Star Spangled Banner, that God loves wearing red, white, and blue, that God has a Trump bumper sticker on his car, that God was born on the 4th of July. And in case you haven't caught it yet, let me just share with you. You can disagree, but you're wrong. God is not American. Let me say that again. God 
is not American. Matter of fact, I like it so much, I'm going to say it a third time. God is not American. And to somehow suggest that in order to be with God, you've got to stand on the side of everything right and wrong about America, that that's what a patriot is, to me is a distortion of the true nature of the God of heaven and all the earth. True patriotism is not simply shedding your blood in uniform. True patriotism is not blind allegiance to a political party. True patriotism is not standing on a corner saying our country is better than your country. Patriotism is not what you do or don't do when the national anthem is played. Patriotism is not hanging an American flag on your porch and putting a Trump sign in your front yard. Patriotism is not yelling at immigrants, telling them to go back to their country. Patriotism is not saying this is our land when your ancestors were immigrants and colonizers and enslavers and murderers and thieves. That is not true patriotism. We are no less American when we see that our nation is not well and decide to say something. We're not anti-American when we peacefully protest. We're not anti-American when you raise your voice and demand a change in your land. You're not anti-American when you lay your life on the job line and you're willing to lose your job for the betterment of someone else. It's not anti-American to call people to register to vote and encourage them to vote so that they can change this land. It's not anti-American to stand against the immorality of the White House. It's not anti-American to commit yourself to public service and put caring for people above making money. It's not anti-American to care more about the health and welfare of your neighbor than you do about American economy and making money. It's not anti-American to enact your right to petition your government to redress it for your grievances without the fear of punishment. As a matter of fact, that's not anti-American. That's being prophetic. Being a prophet is when you call out officials and politicians. Being a prophet is when you speak truth to power. Being a prophet is when you stand boldly against the false prophets of Baal who pay homage to Jezebel. Being a prophet means you declare the Pharisaic use of religion is rotten in the eyes of God. Being prophetic means that you remind the nation that God is not pleased with religion that is devoid of justice. That's why God was displeased with Israel. That's why God is displeased with Babylon. That's why God is displeased with Rome. And that's why God is displeased with United States of America. So I ask you a question. To what is your allegiance? To the prophetic call of God or to the false patriotism of the United States of America? Are you a prophet? Or are you a false patriot? Listen, I'm getting in trouble. I know, I know I'm not going to be invited back for the 41st, the 42nd, the 43rd, or the 44th UTI. But y'all put me up, so you got to deal with me now. One, I see social justice as core to the ministry of Jesus. Two, I distinguish between prof prophetic call and false patriotism. And number three. I understand that I am called to proclaim the gospel while preaching the Bible. This is going to get a little deep, but stay with me. Proclaiming the gospel while preaching the Bible. I want to walk through a little homiletical history, and I'm indebted to Edward Farley in his book, Practicing Gospel, released in 2003, especially his article, Preaching the Bible and Preaching the Gospel. Edward Farley argues that if you look at the homiletical history of Christianity, that the original preaching of the first and second generation of apostles was not the exposition of biblical texts. That when the first and second generation of apostles stood in front of an audience, they did not pull out a Bible and say, follow and read with me, and then begin an exposition. 
Rather, the first and second generation of apostles stood in front of men and women and shared their understanding of the implications of the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They did not take a text and give an exposition, but they talked about the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus Christ and what that meant for their modern hearer. They proclaimed their understanding of the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Edward Farley traces how that original method and model of preaching was influenced by Judaic Midrash, by the delayed parousia, by the death of the original apostles, and by the circulation of Paul's letters. That Edward Farley argues that the original model of preaching, which was to stand and declare the good news of Jesus, was influenced by Judaic Midrash, the delayed parousia, the death of the original apostles, and the circulation of Paul's letters, so that by the time we get to Irenaeus in the mid-2nd century, preaching had shifted. That preaching now was no longer simply declaring the good news of Jesus, but preaching became, like Jewish Midrash, the exposition of biblical text. Ideally, within our homiletic, preaching would be the proclamation of the good news through the exposition of biblical passages. They would be synonymous. But it, was, it is quite possible, and I would argue with you, that it has been historically proven that that's not always the case. That there can be a difference between preaching the Bible and proclaiming the gospel. I want to make certain I'm clear on that, that ideally our preaching would be a proclamation of the gospel through the preaching of the Bible. But historically we have seen it is possible to preach the Bible and not proclaim the gospel. And the Bible without the gospel is dangerous. The preaching of the Bible without a grounding in the gospel leads to some of the worst human atrocities in the history of humanity. Slavery had Bible, but no gospel. White supremacy has Bible, but no gospel. Manifest destiny has Bible, but no gospel. The Crusades have Bible, but no gospel. Israeli occupation of Palestinian land has plenty of Bible, but no gospel. The Holocaust had Bible, but no gospel. Apartheid has Bible, but no gospel. The subjugation and oppression of women in ministry and society has Bible, but no gospel. The oppression of our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters in Christ has plenty Bible, but not an ounce of gospel. Hear me. When you have Bible, but no gospel, you can self-righteously condemn people to hell for their sins while ignoring your own. When you've got Bible, but no gospel, you can create a hierarchy of sin that makes someone else's sin worse than your own. When you've got Bible but no gospel, you can exclude people from being used by God based on what you think you know about them. When you've got Bible but no gospel, you can limit the role and authority of women and homosexuals in the church by quoting Paul and Moses more than you quote Jesus. When you've got Bible but no gospel, you can shit, sit and shout in the sanctuary and never raise your voice against the injustices and violence committed against black and brown bodies and think you're doing God a favor. When you've got Bible but no gospel, you can support a racist, homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic, ableist, philandering, morally unfit, vulgar leader and still call yourself an evangelical. 
When you've got Bible but no gospel, you can tear gas a crowd to make a way for you to go stand in front of a church you've never been in to hold a Bible upside down for a photo op and declare that somehow you are a righteous Christian in the eyes of God. That's what happens when you've got Bible but you don't have gospel. One of the tools of seminary is to teach us proper exegesis of biblical texts. And what we're taught in our introduction to Old Testament, in our New Testament courses, is how to take biblical texts and place them within their literary and their historical context. But maybe, just maybe, we also need to learn how to place biblical context within their gospel context. Not simply their historical and their literary, but how does this passage situate itself within the overall gospel that we're called to preach? Andre Reznor, in his chapter, Do You See This Woman? in the book Theologies and the Gospel in Context, as well as his chapter, Preacher as God's Mystery Steward, in the book Slow of Speech and Unclean Lips, Andre Reznor argues that every preacher needs a working gospel, a personal and theological understanding of the work of God in Jesus Christ that guides their interpretation, application, and homiletical exposition of biblical texts. Let me repeat that. Every preacher needs a personal understanding of the work of God in Jesus Christ that guides your interpretation your application, and your homiletical exposition of biblical texts. The importance of having your own working gospel cannot be overestimated. Professor Reznor argues, it is, and I quote, the imaginative theological and hermeneutical force that drives the way the preacher conceives, plots, and delivers sermons, structures worship services, in which those sermons live, move, and have their being. This working gospel informs the preacher's ultimate goal of preaching, guides her reading of biblical texts and congregational situations, and is directly connected to their deepest convictions about God. And although there be no, may be no consensus on what the gospel is, a preacher's failure to understand her or his own working gospel has dire consequences for the listener. Without a governing working gospel, the preacher may resort to proclaiming the preachable whatever is in a selected passage, even if that whatever does not contain or is even contrary to the gospel. An unknown working gospel fosters an uncritical use and application of scripture that is responsible for the biblical endorsement of historical human atrocities, oppression, avarice, false hope, and is, I quote, the greatest theological and psychological fallout for preachers and their hearers. Beloved, the lens through which we must see every biblical passage is the gospel. We need a gospel orientation toward biblical text, even when those texts contain no gospel or are seemingly contrary to the gospel. So when you look through the lens of the gospel, how do we then interpret slaves obey your masters? When we look through the lens of the gospel, how do we interpret Women keep silent in the church. When we look through the lens of the gospel, how do we reinterpret Joshua 1 through 12, where God seemingly tells Joshua, go into Canaan and kill everybody? How do we reread those passages when we read them through the lens of what God is doing in and through the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection and the return of Jesus Christ? When you exegete a passage without a gospel orientation, 
you may be missing the fundamental preaching assignment, which is to preach the gospel, not just teach the Bible. Beloved, I would argue with you, and you can disagree with me, that the fundamental question of Christianity is not what does the Bible say. Too often, we deal with controversial issues in the body of Christ, and our first question is, what does the Bible say? That is not the fundamental question of Christianity. The fundamental question of Christianity is not what does the Bible say. The fundamental question of Christianity is what does the gospel proclaim? Before you quote Moses and before you lift up Paul, situate yourself in the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection and the return of Jesus Christ. Our question should not be what does the Bible say? Our question should be what does the gospel proclaim? Now, before you get me wrong, I am not suggesting that we abandon preaching biblical texts. I'm simply suggesting that our hermeneutic be guided by our understanding of the gospel. You should not handle the Bible until you first understand the gospel. Because our journey as disciples of Jesus Christ do not begin with Levitical laws. Our journey does not begin with Pauline principles. Our journey as a disciple does not begin with mosaic morals. Our journey as disciples begin when we stand at the cross and accept that in Jesus Christ, God has redeemed us from our sinful nature and opened the doors of eternal life. Our journey as disciples begins with Jesus, and that's also where our understanding of Scripture should begin. Edward Farley argues that the sermon is first of all a preaching of the gospel, not a preaching of the passage. So I leave you in this lecture with a question that hopefully becomes an assignment that hopefully informs your preaching. What is your working definition of the gospel? And is that what you are proclaiming in your preaching? What is your understanding of the gospel? And are you preaching the gospel or are you just teaching the Bible? My prayer is that this time of us sharing will cause you to think about where social justice lands in the gospel. That I have you think about what it means to be a prophet and not a false patriot. And that it'll have you think about the difference between the gospel and the Bible and find a way to proclaim the gospel through the preaching of the Bible. Hopefully in the sermon you're going to witness on tomorrow, I try to exemplify that whether well or not so well, but I'll see you tomorrow as we come back together for worship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howard John Wesley, for such a powerful and strong presentation in your lecture. You have challenged us. I know for myself, it felt like my toes were stepped on. It felt like the mirror was right in front of me. And if I moved to my left or my right, I kept seeing myself. So thank you so much for that challenging lecture. And we look forward on tomorrow to hear your sermon that you stated would complement the lecture. And that is tomorrow evening, the same place, 7 p.m., the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley will deliver the 40th anniversary sermon of the Urban Theological Institute. Again, don't forget that on tomorrow during the day at 11.45 a.m., the Bishop Patricia Davenport will preach during the ULS Alumni Chapel. Please also remember to give something to help us to fully endow this chair. We are close to a million dollars and we want to get it to two million dollars. So the right chair you can make a donation to, you make your checks if you're mailing it to United Lutheran Seminary, attention UTI office at 7301 Germantown Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19119. Or you can give online, uls.edu backward slash give. When you go to that section, you will see the Jeremiah Wright Endowed Chair we ask that you click on that and make your donation, or you can text to give, and that information is provided to you online. Again, thank you 
for sharing with us. Uh, we thank Dr. Wesley uh, for such a powerful and stirring presentation that challenged us to make a difference and to see the gospel in a new light. Thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.